My name is Marco Pignoni. I'm an immigration lawyer from a law firm called Getson and Schatz PC. Our website is researchergreencard.com. Since this is such a short speech, I think all of you know it's impossible for me to summarize all of U.S. immigration law in 10 minutes. Come to our website. You can use us as a resource. We give free consultations year-round. We did a webinar for ASM, which is saved at asm.org. And uh, if you just search for immigration session, you should be able to find that as well. That's a, a better broad overview if you don't know much about the subject. How many of you here are F1 students? Most of you probably. So if you're a student, you have an F1 and you'll have OPT for three years, which means you can work anywhere in the US. If eventually you want to go to industry, uh, you will need what's called an H-1B visa. Um, but you can work as a postdoc on OPT as well in F1 status. So if you do a postdoc, you will probably be on OPT for three years. You can use your F1 visa for that. You can travel freely outside the U.S. in return. Um, eventually, you may end up with an H1B visa to continue working in academia. And you also might have a J1 so that's a different kind of a visa that many postdocs, especially those who get their PhD from outside the U.S., will use. And eventually you want to end up with a green card, okay? You don't have to skip through all of these steps to get to the green card, but many people will end up with at least an H-1 or a J-1 before they, are end up, before they apply for the green card. To go to industry, you have OPT for three years if you got your PhD in the U.S. Uh, if you did not get your PhD in the U.S., you have a problem if you want to go to industry. There's a limited number of H-1B visas, and you have to enter a lottery. You also might win an O-1 visa if you can show outstanding achievement, which does not require that you enter the H-1B visa lottery. So again, if you stay in academia, H-1B visas, or it's called cap exempt, there's no lottery. There's an unlimited number of them you can get one year round. Okay? If you go to industry, however, you're going to enter the lottery. The odds last year were about one in five. So in years past, you know, it was as low as one in two or one in three, but it, it's unfortunately, it's very difficult to win the H-1B visa lottery now. So you should be trying to build your citation level so that you have a chance to win an O-1 uh, if you want to go to industry. So again, the O-1 is being used more and more often now because of the lower and lower odds of winning the H-1B visa lottery. There is no clear black and white rule with regard to what achievement will be judged as outstanding so that you can win your O-1. Citations are the most important thing for the O-1 and for the eventual green card application, which you can self-petition for uh, in the EB-1 and EB-2 categories. So build your citation level. The best tip that I have is, I think a lot of people just publish and they hope that they get citations. If you're publishing in big journals, you will. But if not, I think you can probably help build your citation level by reaching out and networking to people in your field. Reach out to people who cited you. Make sure that other labs in your field know what your lab is working on. Maybe you're going to cite someone in the paper that you're about to publish. You should contact them and make sure they know that. And uh, as long as more people know what you're doing and what you're publishing, I think your odds of getting more citations are better. It's more important than ever. It used to be far easier to win a green card. And now it's much more difficult. Citation level is the most important factor. There are special visas for people from Canada or Mexico called a TN, Singapore and Chile, H-1B1 and Australia, the E3. These people do not have to enter the H-1B visa lottery to go to industry. So it is much, much easier for people from those countries, but uh, most of you are probably not from one of those countries. Okay. So in order to win a green card, there are a couple of paths. Permanent labor certification or a perm case is when an employer files a case for you in which they are required to advertise the position. If an American citizen or green card holder applies that kills your labor certification case and you will not get a green card. In the sciences, in your field, there's a good chance that you can win a perm case though. So if you get a job in industry and you win the H-1B visa lottery, there's a decent chance that the company will do this for you. Just be aware that it belongs to the company and you can't leave the company and still get your green card except under certain conditions, which I don't have time to go into. Uh, but you can self-petition also for a green card in the EB-1A and EB-2 categories. Uh, EB-1B are generally for tenure track teaching positions. They're somewhat easier to win than EB-1A. 10 years ago, we would win EB-1A cases with about 100 citations. We would be very confident we will win. Unfortunately, now you cannot be very confident you will win with seven or 800 citations even, and you could be denied with 1,000 or 1,500 citations. So 
unfortunately, most people are winning their green cards in the NIW category, which is much, much easier. So we're very confident we will win today with about 75 citations, but that has gone up over time. So maybe I would have said 35 citations 10 years ago. It's much more difficult now. We've won cases with single digit citations, but it's much more difficult today than it was 10 years ago. And the requirements might be more and more difficult in two or three years when some of you might be applying. So the problem with NIW is there's a wait because everyone's applying in this category and more and more PhDs are graduating and they're trying to win green cards. So there's a backlog and that backlog used to be only for people from China or India. Not that long ago in 2022, if you talk to me, you would see more of that C, which means current, which means there's no wait time. So if you win your case, you can then apply for a green card immediately. There was always a wait for China and India, but now you can see in the easier national interest waiver, that's the EB2, the easier of the two categories, there is now a backlog for the world, which is everyone, not just China and India. If you're from China, so in the EB1 category, there's about a two-year wait for India, it's about three, and then for the China national interest waiver, uh, you're looking at about a four-year wait, and then for India, you're looking at a 12-year wait. The wait times have gone up and up and up, so that just means that if you had applied 12 years ago and you're from India, you can now apply for your green card. If you start your case now, that wait time could go up and up and up, so your wait time might be 15 years or 16 years. There's no way to tell how long the wait will be. This just, tells, this just tells you that if you had filed before a certain date, you can now apply for your green card. Um, so because there's a backlog for everyone now, you have to plan to maintain your immigration status until you're able to get your green card. More people will be staying in H-1B status. More people will be having to go into J-1 or H-1B status at some point before they get the green card because they will not be able to apply immediately. How to win your case. No one ever wins this method. If you win the Nobel, it's very easy to win. We've never had a client who wins this. So everyone else, probably you, are doing this. Okay. To win the EB1A, this is the more difficult extraordinary ability category. You must satisfy three of these criteria that I'm going to show you very quickly. EB1B, so if a university petitions for your EB1B, you only have to win two categories. It's significantly easier, but it's not easy to win an EB1B. National interest waiver is, again, not easy, but far easier than either of the EB1 categories. You're not required to quote unquote win any category, but you can use evidence that goes toward any of the categories. So I'm gonna run through those very quickly for you. I have about one and a half minutes left. Okay. Receipt of awards. This used to be extremely difficult because they would consider, for example, a province award to not be a national or internationally recognized award. You know, Fujian province in China, large population, but they would say it doesn't count. As of September, 2023, they have loosened this criteria. And so you will try to win this category with, you know, postdoc awards or ASM awards, etc. So uh, this was impossible before. Now it's possible to win this category. This is very rare. Uh, ASM, as far as I know, does not have any achievement-based membership level that young scientists are going to be eligible for. Maybe there's a fellowship. I'm not 100% sure though, but this is a very rare category. Okay, media is a common fourth category for EB1A especially. So if there is uh, media published about your work, uh, this has actually been loosened as well. It used to be that it had to be about you, but now it could just be about your work. So if it's talking about a paper that you know, you're not even the first author on, that still might count as media. So this category has become easier to win. Almost everyone in EB1A must, be, uh, must win this category. So doing peer review in your own name, not through your supervisor, can help you win this category. Uh, but I recommend everyone do some now because the criteria are becoming more and more difficult. This category is where you prove that you've accomplished something. So you've published, let's say, eight papers. We would describe what your academic accomplishments are, not just what they can do in the future, but what you've accomplished in the past that allows uh, perhaps some other work to be done uh, to, to make progress in your field. Uh, this is how we do that. Google Scholar profile is uh, significant. Make sure you have a Google Scholar profile. We submit five recommendation letters that describe your academic accomplishments. Uh, authorship of articles was the last category. Everyone is an author of some articles. This doesn't, this category's become easier as well, but it's relatively rare. And then these two categories are rare as well. Uh, our website is researchergreencard.com. You can find us there and we'll give free consultations year round. You can make an appointment on our website or see me in the track hub if you have any questions. 
That's the most amazing summary of immigration law I've ever given in 10 minutes. That was, I didn't think that was possible. I lied when I said that I thought that was possible, Ray. Thank you very much.